Good afternoon, everyone. The current uh, humanitarian crisis that we hear so much about is a product of the legal mix of U.S. immigration policies, the hardening of border control, militarization, and regional economic models that displace small agricultural producer and urban workers. If economic models and policies that are unsustainable because of the poverty, inequality, and violence that they have generated in the entire region. They have eroded governmental uh, institutions and are pushing to the limit their capacity to govern, only to favor the performances of the multinational corporations and the military and arms industry complex. A substantial increase of people on the migratory corridors coming through from Mexico to the United States, starting in Central America, was noticeable since the beginning of 1914, and it swelled to an actual amount in the months of April, May, June, and July. It showed people pushed by fear, ignoring dangers and the physical and personal sacrifice that the journey through Mexico implies. We have observed on the road and done many, many interviews, and uh, people, women, men and women in their 30s and 40s continue to be the majority of migrants trying to arrive to the United States. There's also an unusual amount of women alone with their children between 0 and 12 year old. And there is an increase of unaccompanied youth between 14 and 18 years old. We also see ethnic groups like the afro honduran Garifunas who did not used to migrate and they're migrating now in groups from 100, uh, 150. They have been thrown out from their traditional lands by the tourism and the mining mega projects. So they're now joining the exodus. The number of people traveling with uh, professional smugglers has increased significantly. They can be seen in bus stations in the southern states guiding scores of the so-called company youth whose parents from the United States hired those members to bring their children to be with them because it's now more dangerous to leave them in their country than to risk the trip north. Seven out of ten migrants interviewed say that they were fleeing due to death threats extortion, the assassination of a close family member by gangs or narcos, and or because they could no longer meet the demands of the criminal groups that charge them the war tax, they call it, to all businesses, to sell on the streets, small, medium, large, everybody has to pay, and when they can no longer pay, they are told, well, give me your son, and we won't charge you anymore. Extortion is so widespread, they even charge a quota to families who receive remittances from the United States. It is a common practice also for the guns to recruit children to act as informants or to sell drugs in the schools, and they execute them if they refuse. Uh, some of the mothers have told us stories that you wouldn't believe. One mother, I asked her, isn't it too hard for you to come with three small kids? She says, they have already killed my two older ones. So I'm running. Another mother told us just recently, we were getting her out of Honduras, that her husband had joined, joined the gangs and they had killed him. And a week later, the killers came to her doorstep, knocked on the door, and gave her a bunch of money. And this, you know, she was terrified. She asked, what is this for? This is to take care of your kids. These are our kids. We're coming to get them when they get to be 12. So she was fleeing also. The situation in Central America is uncontrollable. It, it is more dangerous to stay than to fly, even, even with the dangers on the road. Uh, meanwhile, the mass media here is giving a picture that it's totally a misrepresentation of what's going on. First, there is an increment of all migrants leaving the region. It's not just children. 
Second, the minors are not unaccompanied. Most travel with friends, family, community, professional smugglers. Account unaccompanied means for the United States uh, officials that they're not with a parent or a guardian. The extended family doesn't count. They freak out if the 11 month old babies are coming unaccompanied. Well, they're not unaccompanied, obviously. They're accompanied by the town, the people, the friends, or they're in the hands of professional smugglers since the parents ask them to come. Third, using the term children, it's a little class ethnocentric connotation. The term does not represent the youth over 14 from disadvantaged, disadvantaged social environments that comprise 95% of those detainees. So 95% of the, people, the children that are detained are over 14. Now those 14 year old kids have been working for years. Many, many are married and have their own kids. So you cannot use you know, class definitions to portray a phenomena that is very different. The children 14 to 18, you cannot say, oh, the children, they're detained. Well, these are young men that have lived and seen uh, a lot during their short lives. And as I say, many of them have their own kids to care for. Um, Central American children fleeing from poverty and gang violence are not a migration phenomenon. They're refugees. They're forcibly displaced often from situations that the U.S. policy helped create to begin with. They should be treated as refugees, but not only the kids. All minors of all ages are fleeing from the threat of losing their lives, and so they are technically and formally refugees. Thousands of minors have been deported, violating the universal principle of protecting the higher interest of the child. Since they are returned to the same situations that they fled from and often face domestic violence or death threats, they return to the same places where they were banned for not having accepted joining the local gangs, the Maras, who fortunately re re recruit them to the ranks. In recent interviews, uh, these young men have told us that the gang watched the ports of interest to detect the ones that have been deported. They demand that they pay the war tax owed for the time that they were absent. In their interviews, some of the migrant youth mentioned that young people who have been, have been already assassinated on their, um, as a product of their deportation to um, their own country. And I'm talking specifically about Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala, which are the D3 most uh, hurt countries in the region. Uh, far from having a human rights approach that addresses causes and origins, migration's policies focus on national security, making migrants in sheer numbers invisible, silencing their voices, killing with great violence their footsteps. Two issues are hidden behind uh, Washington's declaration of humanitarian crisis. First is the fact that migrants coming are turning themselves over to the ICE authorities, thus they can no longer be typified as illegals by the system. As long as they were, they did not care that they were coming to engross the ranks of the invisible and documented workers. Now the other issue that it's really has the system in crisis is that um, the administrative system is being strained with all these new cases that have been turned in that they have to process when they already have backlogs of over 350,000 applications to resolve. So there's two issues that are really hurting the United States. The fact that they're no longer illegal and the fact that they're bugging up their already bugged system of uh, processing immigration um, demands. One more element 
that it's feeding these frenzy is that the issue of giving the right wing politicians a very good opportunity to attack President Obama, accusing him that his DACA policies of being an instigator, instigator of this upsurge of immigrants, which is very ironic because um, he's been hit from all sides. We don't like him because he hasn't resolved anything, and the right wing doesn't like him because he's too mean. So, this is a very tight um, synthesis of some of the things that I would have liked to share with you, but I'm going to take, turn this over to Elvira, and she'll give you another side of the same story. La situación que se está viviendo aquí en los Estados Unidos uh, con las familias migrantes por décadas, los gobiernos tanto fueron más agresivos tanto en la administración del presidente Bush como del presidente Barack Obama. The situation that we're living with family here's uh, from uh, out of the country are very difficult and they uh, stem from the policies that are in place even for Barack Obama. La situación en Latinoamérica también está cambiando. Cuando yo fui deportada, me preguntaron si yo tenía miedo de regresar a mi país y yo les dije que no. Pero la realidad, tanto en México como en Centroamérica, ha cambiado. La delincuencia organizada se ha adueñado completamente de nuestra paz y tranquilidad. When I was deported, they asked me if I was afraid to go back to Mexico. And of course I wasn't, but the situation has now changed. Organized crime has taken over all over Latin America, including Mexico. El presidente Barack Obama prometió una reforma migratoria desde su primera campaña a la presidencia. Barack Obama promised uh, immigration reform even at the his first electoral campaign in 1924, the nine, 2009. The only thing that Barack Obama has given um, the, the community has been deportation and separations of families. Muchas de las familias están viviendo en vulnerabilidad en México y Centroamérica y en algunas otras partes del mundo. Some of the families are living in vulnerability in Mexico, Central America and other parts of the world. Niños ciudadanos americanos fueron arrojados a la violencia con sus padres. U.S. American children are, have been thrown to those countries to face the violence because they have to be with their parents. They, they let with their parents. En marzo, yo decidí cruzar la frontera para estar aquí en los Estados Unidos con mis hijos y vivir segura. In March, I decided to come back to the United States and cross the border to be here with my two children and have a safe life. Más familias han cruzado la frontera. El presidente Obama declaró que es una crisis humanitaria, pero en realidad es una crisis de refugiados. Barack Obama has, more families have crossed the border also. And Barack Obama has declared a humanitarian crisis, but uh, it is a crisis of families being separated. Estamos luchando para en cada espacio que tengamos oportunidad de denunciar lo que está pasando con las familias um, que están siendo separadas. We're fighting in every corner that we can so that people know what's going on with the separated by national families. El presidente Obama prometió utilizar su poder ejecutivo firmando una moratoria para detener las deportaciones y separación de familias, pero hizo todo lo contrario. Obama promised to use his executive powers to sign uh, a, a moratorium to the deportations so that families could no longer be separated, but he did the contrary. 1,100 personas están siendo deportadas y separadas todos los días. 1,100 persons are being deported every single day. 
Estamos también nosotros desde la base luchando para reunificar nuevas familias. El 10 de mayo uh, logramos reunificar una familia, el día de los padres logramos reunificar otra familia y vamos a seguir luchando para reunificar más familias. From the ground up we're fighting to reunite families. On Mother's Day we reunited one family. On Father's Day we were able to reunite another family and we're fighting every day to reunite more and more. La ley dice una cosa, pero nosotros luchando sabemos que podemos lograr reunificar a más familias. Vamos a poder lograr mantener a más familias aquí en los Estados Unidos. The law says one thing, but we know that through the struggle we can reunite more families. And we're going to keep on fighting so that no more families are deported and separated. Las familias que están cruzando la frontera, en su mayoría, muchos de ellos van a ser deportados porque no tienen representación legal. Eventually, most of these people that cross the border and turn themselves in, after their uh, immigration process is completed, probably will be deported. Mostly because they have no legal representation when they present themselves to the judges. La única, única forma de lograr fam, uh, lograr que las fami salvar familias es levantando nuestra voz. The only way that we can, that we have on our hands, is just to raise our voices. Thank you. So before I call on Saro, um, as the next speaker, uh, may I call on uh, may I call on Dark Matter for a performance? And then uh, Dark Matter will also panel on what they do this week. Thank you so much for having us, everyone. Um, we're two spoken word poets. Uh, we do LGBT activism in the U.S. and racial justice. Um, we can begin with a chant. When I say gender, you say justice. justice. Gender. Justice. Gender. Justice. justice. Can you do that a little bit louder? When I say gender, you say justice. justice. Gender. Justice. Gender. Justice. Great, here we go. The day after 9-11, my Hindu temple, that one in small town Texas where I grew up believing in God and America and other things greater than themselves. Printed new t-shirts, American flag on the back, the front read, God bless America. And you wore that shirt to school the next day, made sure it fit just right, like the English on my tongue, like the Bible on my hand. Hope that its crisp white would distract the classmates from the newfound terrorist threat of my skin. That day, I woke up and found that I was afraid of myself, too. And at lunch, my white classmate asks me, why did your people did th do this to us? And I point to my shirt, and I point to my flag, and I point to my God. But these, these are things that no longer belong to me, and for the first time in my life, I am not them, I am, I am not Muslim, I am, I am brown. When they call you a terrorist, you believe them the same way you believe in the cool edge of your father's razor as it slices your cheeks. Keep it back. Bleed for your country and we are bleeding for your country, America. We, 1,501 people of Middle Eastern descent, attacked in New York City in 2001. We, Shaiba Ahwadi, beaten in her home as they screamed, fly back to your country, you terrorist. We, New York City taxi driver, stabbed as they asked if he was Muslim. We, hundreds of thousands of people annihilated by your wars. I mean, your ego and how many of us must you deport before you feel white again, America? And how many of us must you torture before you feel like God again, America? And how many of us must you kill before you remove your flags and lower your flags from our countries, America? But the Democratic National Convention was last week, and your president, the same man who will visit your mosques and temples in the U.S. and burn them across the ocean, tells the crowd that America is the greatest nation on earth. And you can hear them clapping, and it sounds like the gunshots on the other channel. God bless America is nothing but a campaign slogan. 
And is this your remembrance? And is this your blessing? And 9-11 is not over. Today your president is sending drones to Pakistan. Today your patriots are raping women in Iraq. But you do not see us, America. Our brown bodies, the sand you must wipe out of your eyes for a clearer vision. I mean imperialism. Our brown bodies, the jerk you must move out of your path towards freedom. I mean propaganda. Our brown bodies, the shit you must use to grow your economy. I mean your capitalism. So I no longer wear your shirts. So I no longer believe in God or America. Is there a difference? But I believe in the brown of my skin. Believe it the way the man at the restaurant calls me, brother, this gospel of our people. All that you've left for us to cling on to. So God brown America. And this is my blessing. And this is my remembrance. And these are our soldiers. Rest in power. The day after the Boston Marathon, my Facebook news feed is full of red and pink equal signs next to news about the bombings. Boston is a rallying point for independence. The marathon is a rallying point for independence. National tragedy is a rallying point for the state to exploit its people's fears. Two men are stopped at Logan Airport for speaking Arabic on a plane. Mourning brings forth a fresh imperialism. At sunrise, at death, brown bodies are supposed to return to the sand they came from, to the dirt they labor on. Equal signs appear in the horizon like two towers bending over, America remembering how to make skin illegal, how to steal colors and put them in a rainbow. The Middle East is backwards. Let's bomb them off the map. Black people voted for Prop 8. Let's build more prisons to incarcerate their homophobia. Palestine does not have enough gay bars. Let's fund its occupation. Asia has no sexuality at all. Let's exploit their bodies for our labor. That Friday, would be day of silence. Every white liberal I know would slap an ally sticker to their chest proudly declare, I pledge allegiance to the American fat. And President Obama will talk about Stonewall and slip a check to Israel and send drones to Yemen and brown hands will construct these closets for white bodies to come out of and the State Department has allocated three million dollars a year to LGBT rights abroad. We will stake our claims all over the world, which is not like colonization because these new flags are made of rainbows and the people of Kabul will send their love to Boston. This is the language the Department of Defense will listen to as they inscribe their battle plans and love letters with the same X's and O's mask the thunder of machine guns in the beating of pink hearts, a human rights crusade. Every marriage license, a license to kill. Two men will be stopped for speaking Arabic on a plane in America. Two men will be celebrated for being gay in America. To have and to hold, till death do us part. It's really important to us um, that the conversation around gender and sexuality justice is part of development justice, and that when we think about gender and sexuality justice, we don't think about marriage equality. We talk about economic justice for gender and sexual minorities. Gender and sexual minorities should be part of all of our mass people's movements, so we just want to represent those issues for you when our final poem. Thanks so much. San Francisco, where white people are getting gay married, but I don't have an invite. Shahoo! Somewhere over the rainbow, blue birds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why can't oh why can't I? Because you're brown, honey girl. I'm about to sassy gay friend this. Not gay as in happy, but queer as in fuck you. Rainbows are nothing but refracted white light. Gay marriage activism is nothing but a temper tantrum. Like, mommy, can I get an I'm a second class citizen American apparel v-neck to go with my corporate internship and some ass? 
I didn't always think this way, because St. Louis taught me everything I still know about shame, but looking like a faggot with a cunt only meant that I was looking for trouble. So in high school, I laced my shoes with rainbows and preached the gospel of equal rights and pride. They tell us that marriage will finally untangle our love from our shame. We'll legislate as wholly human. But on the day DOMA was repealed in the United States, it didn't get better, because somewhere over the rainbow, there's a pot of Goldman Sachs. Dun, 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 dun. We are gathered here today. So richer, so poorer. Tell that to Elijah, who lost his job last year. He lives in one of only 12 states where you cannot legally be fired for having a body that does not sit right with your heart, but his job could only be done by a man whose general rules did not conform to his employer's expectations. I do not know whether he won the court case, only that he has a son and that being brown and trans means being four times less likely to find work, but who needs money for bread when you can eat wedding cake? Tell that to in good times and in bad. Tell that to Temi Bressar. A trans woman from New York who was arrested for using her father's discount subway card. The NYPD chained her to a wall for 13 hours and called her a he she to, to have and to be held. This is what marriage means for queer people as we send the government wedding invitations to incarcerate our love till Tell death do us part. Tell that to Asher Brown, who at 13 took a gun to his head as if it was an act of patriotism because in Texas, being gay is a death sentence. It is night to whispering secrets to open skies and sound of your mother crying as she wonders how that thing came out of her. And I do, I do, I do not believe that a marriage certificate could have stopped the bullet. Remember, 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 rainbows are just a trick of the light. They make us forget that the storm is still happening when walking towards the end of a rainbow, and it will always move away. Gender justice. Gender justice. Gender justice. Okay, so thank you very much for the performance. Uh, I'm sorry, but they have to leave now. <laughs> uh, so um, I now call on uh, Saro Tiantara. So Saro is a human rights activist and current president of the movement for the survival of Uguni people and uh, his newest organization is the International Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, of which he is part of the International Coordinating Committee. So, welcome, Sam. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I am the Bosse Saro I'm the president of the movement for the sort of good people, Mosa. Um, I don't want to share our own story of what the global justice means to us and what the tripod of government, international finance, and the private sector can do to the people in the name of profit. Um, Ogoni is a very small uh, indigenous community in Nigeria. We occupy 1,000 square miles and kilometer. And um, it's largely Ogoni is, is an agro-based economy. Uh, we do fishing and uh, farming. But something happened, we live a very harmonious life in nature because our entire life revolves around land. By the very culture and custom and tradition, we worship land because for us, everything is taken from the land. And land and the average body person have a harmonious relationship. But something happened in the 50s. Oil was discovered on the Goni land. And when oil was discovered on the Goni land, everything about the body person changed. Because when Shell arrived in Ogoni, they lied to us that the situation of the Ogoni man will change. The government lied to us that our situation will change. But 30 years after oil production, we discovered that everything went to their lives. The Ogoni environment got destroyed to the point that we couldn't even drink from our water. We found a situation where our local economic support system, agriculture and fishing, could no longer take place because all the things we attempt to plan were dying. 
And then for those who were going to fish, the same situation happened. They were not able to fish any longer. And then we saw a combination of the forces of globalization, the forces of capitalism, the forces of neoliberal economy, forced upon all because we're going to also tie to what they call the Niger Delta, where all the multinational corporations of earth, especially the oil sector, operate. You have the shares, you have the Mobi, you have the Chevron, all of them operate there in the Niger Delta. So we've come to that point in our life and in our, in our time when everything is going to collapse. Beyond the question of collapse of agriculture or collapse of, uh, of, of, of the environment, there was no way that we could share even the benefit that was coming out of this whole thing. So the question of environmental justice was on one side, the question of social justice of all particular, even the benefit of what was, I mean that God found it pleasing to place in our land. We didn't have any role to play in even what was coming out of our land in terms of getting the benefits. And beyond that, we also saw that this whole thing about the oil production for servicing even the oppressive tactics that were being used by even the majority that were combining with the oil sector to destroy the environment. And attendant to all this was the whole question of diseases because at some point we started seeing the emergence of different types of diseases in the body, particularly um, respiratory problems because we have oil production for over 40, literally 40 years I would say the context of that oil production, we have gas flares that were running 24 hours a day for 30 years. That keep everything related to plants and to animals around the surrounding environment. That was the situation that we were going to go to. And at some point in the 90s, we began to ask ourselves questions. That how can we be in this sort of environment, a so-called paradise on earth, but yet we are living in abject poverty. We are living in diseases, we are living without infrastructure, we are living as in 1990, there was no single power in the body. So we live in that same land, and at the end of every year, Shell would declare massive profits on the same property, the same natural resource that was coming out of our land. Shell would declare good profit this year, the following year they would declare not profit, they even found more than what they got to So on a daily basis, we saw an increment a profit that share of getting out of our land, yet in return, our communities were harvesting debt. In fact, it got to a point where the biggest social event in the body was burial ceremonies. When the young people go for weekend or going to the village for the weekend, it's that all about going for burial ceremonies. Yet, those who are driving capitalism, those who are operating in the realm of the development agenda that makes profit the ultimate, we are busy announcing good profit at the end of the year at the expense of the harvest of death that we are going in the body. But there come a time in our life and as a people when we began to question the activities of the multinational corporation and the activities of the government. Because in Nigeria, you cannot separate the activity of the oil companies from the ruling government in power. So we got to that point where we started asking questions and we organized ourselves from village to village, the young, the old, the intellectuals, and the non-intellectuals, we all came together on an organization we call the Movement for the Support of Golden People that was rooted in the Golden Communities. It was with that platform that the 90s, the Golden People began to challenge the activities of Shell and began to challenge the activities of the government of acting the civic alliance with Shell. The victory of that was that the mass mobilization that took place across the Golden communities was something that Shell couldn't stand. And after three years or four years of consistent protest, Shell was forced to pack out of Golden Land in 1993. And the day Shell is not yet back in the Golden Land because of what people's power can do in terms of that level of repression, in terms of that level of environmental injustice that we saw in the Goli land. And that people's power has been one that has kept the Goli environment in a little protection to this day. But what we presently contend with is that there are legacies of the oil operation that were taking place in the Goli 
Because pipeline it across the entire Bono community through the period of this oil exploration. And we've been dealing with the impact of the OSPs. Because of the crisis of Ogoni people, I mean, the, the struggle, we got to a point in the 90s when we, got, we launched the struggle, the government increased the pressure with the support of Shell. Over 2,000 souls were lost in Ogoni. Over 14 communities were completely destroyed by the military in the name of protecting uh, the pipelines of Shell. But it come in, uh, in 1998, we had the UN uh, Special Rapporteur of Eastern Nigeria and then recommended for uh, an environmental study of Ogoni land. For the first time in our history, in 2006, the United Nations Government Program was invited to go in to do their study. What was shocking in that study is that for the first time, even when we were talking about governmental degradation and what oil exploration has done in terms of governmental injustice, we never imagined the level of destruction of the environment on the UNEP releases report in 2011, where UNEP pointed to the fact that even the pollution we are talking about was far more than what we had imagined, because it pointed to a particular situation where all the water systems in Ogoni have been polluted to a situation where benzene concentration in water samples that were drawn from Ogoni was 900 times the world health standard. And people have been drinking that type of water for over 10 to 40 years. And all of us know that benzene is a carcinogenic agent. And that can account for a high level of cancers, high level of uh, respiratory challenges that we have over the time, high level of skin diseases, not to talk of what has gone even into the, the, the biological cycle where these things have moved into plants, have moved into fishes, have moved to all sorts of things. So that was where we, we, we got to, and now the struggle we have on our hands is how to get the good environment clean. Because the report itself has established a basis that Shell can no longer deny. When we started the struggle, Shell was living in denial. They were still with exaggerated what was there in the good environment. But with that report today, Shell can no longer deny the fact that the oil extraction of Goni and Goni had destroyed the entire Goni environment. And that is a campaign that we are involved in at the moment because the report actually recommended steps that the Nigerian government had to take, that Shell as a company had to take, to clean the Goni environment and also to restore whatever that has been lost in terms of biodiversity that have uh, that, uh, that have got lost as a result of oil exploration. So that has been our story in Ogoni, and I think that uh, the people like you here, yeah, we see the Ogoni challenge as the challenge, the sort of development model that is driven around only profit making, but doesn't show any compassion for where the resources are being taken from. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Now, I will invite uh, Agnes Kanaka and Bianca Matina from Papua New Guinea. They represent women of Catholic Island in Papua New Guinea, and they will share all the stories of being the first environmental um, refugees. So currently, they're also, well, both of them are working with the uh, women in their own uh, communities. And uh, through a participatory, uh, through a feminist participatory action research to ensure that women have an active role in determining their own development path. Particularly for Agnes, Agnes and uh, uh, Agnes and Bianca, please come in front. Uh, Agnes, uh, well, particularly for Agnes, this is her first time to move out or to go out from her island in Bukhen Bay. And this is also her first time to travel, uh, especially coming here to the US for this event and other events that she was able to participate. And uh, when she, uh, when they got in, in uh, Los Angeles, was it Los Angeles, yeah, she was detained for almost four hours at the immigration office. So this is her, yeah, so this is her first time to come out to the island of her. Uh, uh, so uh, I now give the mic to uh, Agnes. 
Good evening, everyone. Do you know where Papua New Guinea is? Papua New Guinea is on the people of Australia. My name is Ernest Kinaka. I'm 36 years old. I'm a single mother with four children. I belong to the highest speaking people of Cartridge Island from Papua New Guinea, who amongst the world's best environmental migrants. Our island is part of us. For a thousand years, this island provided for our ancestors and us. They provided us food, our homes, our way of life. But our islands are rapidly disappearing and no longer safe. It's a matrilineal community. I should be able to provide my children with future that comes from their inheritance communal right to our islands. In the past 10 years, as the sea level water rose and huge tidal waves began to ravage our islands, hundreds of us living on the island experienced the terror of environmental devastation, where we could no longer bring our families there. One day, in 1989, huge waves crashed through my island, breaking the island into two parts. I was terribly I thought God, God, the Creator, was punishing us because there was always the beginning of Bougainville crisis. I was confused. The giant waves went through the island, taking with it every, everything on its path. Plants died. There was no food, no safe drinking water. Women and children had little to eat. When they were sick, there were no medication. No shipping, no communication with outside world because of the bill blockade created by the government. As a single mother of four children, I had no choice but to move to Buka, Bougainville, where government had arranged for migrants from the low lying island to relocate. Today, I live with around 70 people from my communities in one of these relocation sites. Moving to Buka and life is, in settlement is very, very hard. We have no gardens. Our survival depends on us, women growing small market in gardening or sharing whatever we have. But here in the Buka settlement, there's nothing to share. When family goes hungry, everyone goes hungry. We are now on Buka. We don't have access to same diet. We don't own our control land. We have lost everything we know and depend on. Ruth Namwe and elder women express with emotion that she will not leave her island home of the Carthrex, this where she was born, where her roots are, where her ancestors roam and fish, where life is simple and enjoyable. She called on developed countries to stop wheels of destruction to save her island. My people live their lives dependent on the revolving around the sea. The sea determines their diet, their knowledge, their skills. Our loss and damage is generational, invisible, and marks the loss of culture and way of life. Bougainville suffered years of resource related to war. The war caused generational impact and the mind. They will not have all the public services needed let alone providing for migrants from the others. There is high rate of violence against women, infant, and maternal mortality. Our loss is not an accident. We believe our island has been lost because of climate change, resource extraction. We did not cause the world to warm. We did not overfish, overlook, or try to become rich. But we are paying the price for those in the world who did. Together with the women from the community have started to talk about the loss and damage we have experienced through due to climate change caused by others. While making resettlement plans, we are working with our governments to formulate a policy that takes into account our needs and those of our children and community. We want the world to know our stories. We would like to show the world what greed 
and the need to consume everything is due to the indigenous peoples of the world. We want justice from the world community. They must promise to stop global warming and there must be a way to make sure governments keep their promises to all people. Even those in faraway islands, we don't want other women to suffer the way we did and we want, to, we want a future for our children and future generations. We must choose ways that will allow everyone in the planet to live in a sustainable way and not destroy whatever resources we, we have left. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Agnes. So very related to the story of uh, our sister from Bogan Bay, Bill, Papua New Guinea, is another story of climate change. So I will call on Aguida Fentis Bautista. Aguida. Aguida is an educator and an environmental activist. She heads the People's Surge, an alliance of survivors from Typhoon Haiyan that hit the middle part of the Philippines and claimed 6,300 lives and affected 11 million people in early November 2013. So it will uh, be uh, almost a year. She brings the voices of the survivors who until now are seeking social and climate justice. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I had a presentation that will take a long time. In fact, the first presentation I had, it took me one hour to present the whole thing. So it's almost 10 months now after I am, and I think many of you already know what happened in the Philippines. What I could share with you would be my personal experiences with my, with my group and how we survived after. Now, there is a, you know, there's some data that we have uh, gathered that it's not only 6,000 who perished or during the onslaught of Yolanda, it's more than 18,000 according to forensics report. And there could be more because during the, you know, when Haiyan was there and after Haiyan, uh, individual families would just gather their dead, you know, around them and then bury them anywhere because there were no cemeteries, no funeral parlors, and nothing. There were no schools, no government offices, nothing. In the Eastern Visaya especially, we are six provinces and four of these provinces are totally devastated. The whole Philippines is about 75 to 80% agriculture. So it is mirrored in the different regions. In Eastern Visaya, the same thing. Now, um, immediately after or before uh, Haiyan, the president was there on TV announcing to the people, saying to you who are there in the Visayas region, Haiyan is coming, Yolanda is coming, it's going to be a very strong typhoon, take care of yourselves, we are having some preparations for you, and immediately after the flood, you know, resides, we are there to give you assistance. Where was this promise? It was only six days that they came to the airport and gave water to the people there who were gathered. Immediately after Haiyan, C-130, this Ameri uh, uh, an army plane, Howling people, you know, bringing them out of the of the global city, you know. And a friend of mine, whom I saw uh, two months after in Manila, where I was saying, he she experienced, you know, this in Vinimor Air Base in Manila, where there were a lot of evacuees being, you know, held by this uh, American plane every 30 minutes. And he said from November to December, she was able to assist through the help of friends through Facebook who came and had their transportation. He, she was, they were able to assist evacuees, about 20,000 of them evacuees, you know, to, to look for their relatives in Manila as far as the, the northern part of, uh, of Luzon and even to Mindanao by means of uh, transportation. So the people were there, especially those in the far-flung barangays and municipalities, they never had any relief or assistance from the government, not even in the center, you know. Uh, relief was there, but we were still to go and, and look for it and, and get it by our own transportation. 
But there was no transportation. All the, the transportation, the jeepneys, the, the, the multi-cars, the tricycles, they were flown away or sunk, you know, by the 21 uh, feet of water in Tacloban City. So how could you get your relief from a center? So we looked for that, we asked for help, and there was nothing because network, you know, was, was down, no communication whatsoever, no electricity. So we found our way by ourselves, together. After two months, we came to Tacloban City, 13,000 of us. We gathered in one remaining building in Tacloban City, and we call ourselves People Search. The people has to search, has to go and find our life, our own survival. So we we, uh, we went to Manila. Some of us went, went to Manila in February and March. We went to the national government. The, the, the sister, who was our chairperson before, came with about 10 people to Malacanang, bringing petition to the government, about 7,000, uh, 7, no, 17,000 uh, signatures coming to Manila to ask the president, please give us cash. We need cash. We don't, we cannot survive only with noodles and, you know, this rice, and old rice stuck in one of the bodegas somewhere, and the sardines, which even I myself, after eating five, you know, in five days all sardines, even the dog would not even face the sardines anymore. <laughs> so I said, we need something more. You know, we need relief, we need also, of course, rehabilitation. Now, now 10 months has gone, we still have 15,000 people in 10 cities, in bunk houses, and in evacuation centers. That's how the government, you know, treated us. We, especially the people search. Now here, I'm here in the north. Of course, I was invited by 350.org to you know, participate in the People's March. We were 14 uh, so-called global climate ambassadors. We shared with each other our lives in our own countries devastated by climate change. And so uh, our demand now is not only for relief. We know that what happened to us, especially in the developing countries, is not our fault. It is a fault of the history of colonization, a history of plunder of our natural resources in our country. So we have nothing. We are rich in natural resources. We have mineral resources. We have gold. We have chromite. We have everything that we can do to order to, to develop ourselves. But the intervention of other countries, especially the U.S., until now in our country, you know, intervening in our political affairs, in our economic affairs, and even cultural affairs. Because even now, they're trying to take away our language from the education system. They don't want us to teach Tagalog anymore. They don't want us to teach Filipino anymore in college. So this is really eradicating the entire, you know, uh, how do you call this, the people of the Philippines, so to speak. So we are here to demand development justice. There are plans, rehabilitation plans, there are plans to, you know, to help the survivors, but a lot of money poured in also, in terms of donations from all of you here, all over the world, who came to us to help us. But the money is stuck in the coffers of the government. They don't even release that. You know, and we, in the people search, about more than 25,000 of us in the group, you know, are there organizing ourselves, sharing with each other's burden, and helping us out, get out of this uh, misery. You know, uh, we are here to demand that justice, you know, from, from uh, those who are responsible for that. So I'm glad to be here, to be with you, and I know we are in solidarity, we have the same problems, you know, with climate change and the development, so-called development programs which are implemented in our countries but do not really address the real basic issues of our people. Land, work, employment, and simply human rights to survive and to live just like human beings in this world. Thank you. Thanks, Lida. That was an eight-minute presentation. Exactly. So, okay, from from Mexico to uh, Papua New Guinea, and then. Nigeria to the Philippines, we now go to Northeast India. So, uh, may call on Jiten Yuna. 
a Chitas journalist, an indigenous people's rights activist. He's also serving as the Secretary General of the Center for Research and Policy, Manipur or Kram. And he is also a member of the International Coordinating Committee of the Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. Welcome, Jitan. So let me first convey my best uh, regards to distinguished Secretary General of Peoples People's uh, General Assembly and also regards to all the magic committee of today's uh, People's General Assembly. Uh, I'm sorry, so let me focus on specific areas that I uh, uh, engage in, in North East part of India. I belong to the Mijay people of Manipur in North East part of India and the North East part of India bordering Burma, Bangladesh, China and uh, Nepal is just one of the most biodiverse city, uh, diverse region and in fact one of the uh, 35 biodiverse coastal region where the Brahmaputra Barak river system runs through the region. So in terms of the diversity, biodiversity is very rich. And this is where India, the rising India as a global economic superpower is planning to build more than 200 mega hydroelectric power projects. So that it fuels the growth of countries like India along with other uh, you know, other countries. So, like since 1990s, what we find is like there is an opening up of India's economy, and along with that, we find a series of free trade agreements signed with ASEAN, the NATO countries, and also with Europe. You know, so there is a lot more process to liberalize or uh, India's economy, and along with that, what we find is like there is a surge of the entry of international multinational corporations and also the Indian corporate bodies coming in, in our land and also destroying our river, destroying our water, destroying our resource and everything what we have. So we have this slurry of oil companies, we have a slurry of uh, big hydroelectric power companies coming in. So we are now, most of the campaign is now focusing on uh, the campaign against large and big dams. And some of the special campaigns that we run is the campaign against uh, the Tipaimu. It's a 1,500 megawatt Tipaimu uh, multi purpose project. It's a huge project that will submerge more than 27,000 hectares of land, forest land. Uh, and in fact, many of these dams are, are also being projected as solution to climate change. And in fact, I was uh, listening to some of the reports of yesterday's, uh, some, uh, yesterday's proceedings of the UN, uh, what is it, climate summit yesterday. And in fact, most of the countries are focusing on promoting renewable energy. And one of the renewable, so-called renewable energy is promotion of big hydroelectric power projects. And we have seen how these hydroelectric power projects have actually destroyed our lives, people's lives, have destroyed devastated people's future. We have seen how such big hydroelectric power projects have actually destroyed our ecosystem, our forests, and also led to an extensive militarization. Because in our place, because of the uh, political and other reason, there is an ongoing movement for right to self determination. Uh, the right from autonomy to, you know, especially for Manipur, there is an ongoing movement for secession. But then, already there is a long standing pattern of militarization, you know, and in that context, when you come up and open up that economic uh, liberalization and look with the corporate onslaught in the land, what you find is like the very militarization process, the very military structure, the state structure has been used to support the very uh, development of the process in our, in our land. So one of the biggest challenges in our case is not just the impact of uh, displacement or destruction of the environment or you know the, the unaccountability of the corporate bodies. What we also find is the increased militarization and related human rights violation. And in fact, the community who comes up with opposition against big dam, you know, like there is a dam called Mafikhel Dam. This is one of the most controversial dams, which is still ongoing project. Uh, ongoing construction and whereby there is a huge opposition from the community on account of the submergence of crime because the land uh, and also the accountability of the unaccountability of the corporate uh, debt particular body. Uh, so in that case there is an extensive liberation of the dam site area. And also the defined dam I was referring to uh, because it's a dam which the, which the government cannot build because or the corporate bodies cannot build because of the uh, huge opposition. What we find is there is an extensive liberation in and around the area where that particular defined town is planned. And, uh, and one of the most important uh, aspects 
which uh, when it comes to the uh, promotion of big dams in our region uh, is the increased privatization of process. You know? So for example, the Dubai uh, Dam, just before I come, last month, four new memorandum of understanding has been signed for four new dams in Manipur. That's where I come from. And these are memorandums which are signed with private corporate bodies, you know, along with public corporate. So there is an increased privatization process. And that's a challenge. What you find is like the, the privatization of development, you know, business, uh, delegating business and private parties to lead development. I think that is happening right from the local level to the international process happening. So we're talking about the sustainable development goal. We're talking about the climate change, uh, something happening. So I think that process is coming, coming through in almost every space of our life, every sphere of our life. You know? And I think that is something that is the most, uh, most uh, concerned. And we're talking about the sustainable development uh, goal where private, uh, privatization or business has been promoted as the agent of, key agent of change, key agent of development. But then already, already the private parties have been, or business has been already conferred the, the, you know, the, 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 the full authority to, to take care of our land, you know, to destroy our land or to run hammock, uh, hammock in our land. So I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we have, and along with that, uh, the issues of human rights violation. You know, and when we talk about development justice, the need to, to undo this kind of development model you know, and uh, pay and trust and trusting on private sector or the business to lead development with the stress life. And I think that is something that we need to uh, take away. And, and, and for the indigenous community in our part, what we find is like most of these development projects are being pursued with clear denial of our right to save the nation. And there is a tacit disregard of our people's right over our land, over our resources, over our future. You know? So the, the need to ensure our participation is something which has been uh, disregarded and the military, the state structure has been used to subdue our voice and indigenous leaders are targeted, jailed, harassed, and also, you know, arbitrarily uh, incarcerated. I think that is that that's some of the human rights uh, challenges that, that we have. And when we talk about development justice at a larger level, I think uh, the human rights based approach to development is something that we need to continue to uh, emphasize on and ending militarization in any form of development. When you relegate military to to you know to, to take control of the development process, I think that is that will never get to development justice. It will rather it will lead to Development injustice and uh, for indi indigenous communities, uh, respecting or right to self determination is one of the fundamental and most important processes to ensure development justice. And with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jiten. So, from the story of Northeast India, uh, among indigenous peoples from Northeast India. I, uh, our next uh, speaker is a veteran human rights campaigner and founder of the Asociación Rak A of Lago A. I hope I pronounced that <laughs> the organization well. And she's, uh, this is a Guatemalan organ uh, uh, organization that advances uh, indigenous people's rights and welfare. So she herself is an indigenous uh, person. So may I call her Norma Maldonado. Good afternoon. I'm gonna take advantage of the media that we have here. Um, no, 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 it has to be up here. So We come from, I'm really, um, I was kind of frustrated these few days with what was going on and, and we, in this so-called summit for climate change and, and world conference and indigenous people, but um, honestly I'm getting all this new renewable energy, but from my colleagues and people from all over the world struggling because we need the stamina and we need the strength to continue with this fight. And I'm really glad that there are these phenomenal uh, leaders here sharing with you. Um, I will uh, not take anything for granted because I see other faces here, so I'm going to use my presentation eventually. Um, I have at some
some PowerPoint where it shows where we are and what we're struggling. And I'd like to pick up on some of the issues that we already have said in terms of land grabbing and using all our resources and what we are doing and why are we so much um, surrounded by greed and, and, and need by the so-called developed world because I just want to tell you that a lot of people that you see here today uh, speaking to you come from these regions that uh, they're so-called the uh, developing world and what, uh, what's in red means uh, biodiversity by species so it's 5,000 species per square kilometer so we call, we come from Central America there, and then you see the Pacific. We're coming from these highlands here from Mesoamerica, and that's what the richness is. Of course, they call us the poor countries. And the question for me, for all those who are new uh, in, in this, I showed you my colleagues these maps before, it's that the, the color green means species per square kilometer. And the, the green in the United States and green in Europe mean 200 species per square kilometer. And we in red, literally, we in red are 5,000 species per square kilometer. So the question is who are the, re the rich countries? Who are the rich countries? We are. We are the rich countries impoverished by the, by the countries who are extracting everything possible from within, from above, from, you know, the water, the mining, the, could you go on please? See, see who spends all the energy here. <laughs> who spends all the energy in, in, in the world? And why is so much greed? And why these summits there where you can really go through? millions of dollars in security so you can get close to that. See how many bodyguards and people were there guarding the, the big corporate business and protecting our governments who are there. Most of our governments are genocidal governments. They have killed population. Like the Guatemalan government is a military government. And they are killing and continue the killing with the, with the Thankfulness from uh, the United Nations and the Obama administration for sending all his labor and free hands to work on the United States. We saw at the beginning the migration of all the people from my country because of land grabbing, because of hydroelectrics, because mega projects, and because we have this richness. And so, so so we are here today and we want to take advantage of every space and minute to tell you that in every place that there is richness, there is militarization. Because we have the, what the, the world needs to refurbish this capital system, capitalist system that is, is dying off but needs our richness to refurbish. And they call that green economy, the greening of the economy. So it means that, you know, that's where we have around there all the, the, the trade agreements that they want. You know, we have sent everything that we have for hundreds of years, now they make trade agreements. After we have sent all the gold and all the money because they want legality. They want to have everything by law. These trade agreements are above our constitution. And like the one we're fighting very hard, Monsanto law, because Monsanto wants our seeds too. They want our food. They want our water, our food, our mining, our biodiversity. What else? We're sending people to. You see what's happening to the people coming here. Treated like animals, are persecuted, paramilitary groups in Arizona and Texas killing people like they're animals. And we keep sending them because they're undocumented taxpayers. People don't receive any benefits but a lot of humiliation. And because all these, because all these is, is what the territory is in demand. We have it in the territory. The World Bank is interested in the 
Mesoamerican biological corridor or biotechnology. So far, they have explored only 2% in biotechnology and bioengineering. So there's 98% to be exploited. So that's why all these green economy and all these bullshit, excuse me, work. <coughs> Next, please, we get really upset sometimes for not being so explicit. And I'm tired too because we don't see our points come across in many documents. And even if they come across, the UN agenda is not our agenda. So we have suffered this enough, and I can go on and on and on here with all these people, but we see two agendas going through parallel, and they don't meet. So I don't have an answer. I just hope that in the North, you get more organized, and those 400,000 people come every day to the streets, because we're every day in the streets, blocking roads with our bodies, so machinery doesn't go in for mining. We're protecting the rivers. We're protecting the seas, protecting every day. Since I remember, I we have been protecting. And I'm going to die, and this is what I'm going to inherit to my children and my grandchildren. I don't see the end of the tunnel here unless I change the system. System change. Remember? <coughs> Let's change the system. And so, for that we need your help. We won't be able to do it. We are already offering our lives. But we're putting the lights on in front. So we need the North to be more aggressive. And I understand that you have been with all this Patriot Act and all these laws that you intimidated. But I think it's it's time to get up again. And I don't know how, I know you're vigilant, they read whatever you read, the Facebook, they, there's people like this, Nolan, and there's the other guy in prison in the Equatorian Embassy in, in, in London because he discovered all this stuff that they, you go through in the North, but we need you up front in the front lines with us. Thank you very much. Norma. So, from Guatemala, we will move on to Nepal. So, do you know where Nepal is? Yes. Where is it? So, Nepal is yeah, where you find Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. So, um, she cannot believe that yesterday she spoke in the United Nations Climate Summit as one of the four speakers from civil society and they were the only ones chosen from an application of 500. She is also an indigenous woman from Nepal involved in a feminist participatory action research on the particular impact of climate change to the most marginalized Mughal indigenous women in the remote northwestern region of Nepal. So let's welcome Alina Saba. Uh, hello everyone, it's nice to see you. Uh, I work as a climate change researcher in one of the most remote communities, and I would like to stand here. One of the women from the remote community during my research group discussion said that agriculture is more important for us than business or other work because business is risky and it's not unsustainable in supply livelihood, but land is always there for us and even uneducated women like us can work in the field and produce food, whereas business and other work requires school qualifications. But due to impact of climate change, we have lost our lands and food production, and this worries us a lot. This remark hits me like a bullet. The Mughal indigenous woman with whom I am working as a researcher on climate justice is one of the most marginalized and disadvantaged community of Nepal. They are the inhabitants of Mugu district, one of the least development and remote mountainous regions. It takes us as long as two days of walk to reach the district center. The village lacks the basic services, access to health, electricity, drinking water, and education. 
It faces acute food crisis every year. The women of the Mugu and Mangro village with whom I work have never got the opportunity to get organized and mobilized for the rights before. Through the Climate Re Justice Research Project of Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, they have not only formed the women's group for the first time in their village, but are now becoming aware of the climate change and climate justice concepts and have recognized the impacts of climate change in their lives. In the last seven to eight years, they have been experiencing the change in the rain pattern, snow melting, rising temperature in their cold mountain weather and crop failures. They already own very little and have a sustainable life. They don't contribute to carbon emissions but are bearing the highest burden for the emissions and fossil fuel consumed by the developed country by losing their agricultural land and precious medicinal herb which is their only source of income. Every year in June and July, when the snow melts in the highest, higher, higher Himalayan region, they take a long journey in the, in the mountains to collect the precious medicinal herbs. They travel as long as four to five days in the cold weather. Every single person who can walk and can survive the severe weather conditions goes to collect the herb. Even the school remains closed for a month. The income for this herb is the only is the only way of supporting family, children, and health services. They use the income from this to buy the food and stock it in a stores it in a stock to supply for a whole year. Because as the road to the district center is damaged by landslides and are dangerous to travel on a frequent frequent basis, many people have lost their life to dry landslides while walking in that path which is the only path that connects the village to the district center. Every year for the past four years, they have lost their land, their land and crops before harvesting due to landslides. Nothing has been done to support it. It has gone, the loss and damage has been gone unreported because they are not aware of the concept of reporting or concept of climate change. Women spend nine months a year working in the field. They hardly get any break. Life is hard in the mountains, and climate change events have, has made it even harder. They have lost their only water mill in the village, which I used to grind the flour due to landslide, and now travel as long as four, year, four hours back and forth just to grind the flour, as they use flour to make bread as they step on meal. Many of the people losing their crops to landslides and getting the herbs have compelled them to look for migration as the other source of income. Many people who live as migrant workers end up doing unsafe and dangerous work. The biggest threat is to women. They often end up being trafficked to unsafe domestic work, such subject of abuse, sex slave, and even death. More than two million at least people are migrant workers and majority are indigenous. Two million max, more than seven percent of the total population of Nepal. As we indigenous community are the spot expert of sustainable living, we can be the expert of sustainable development. We want our national government to include us in the local level decision making bodies, to include us in the national project and plans, so that we can design the best community best solutions that work for us rather than corporate driven high project that makes rich more wealthy. We lose our identity, our livelihoods, our land, our community because of consumption and carbon emissions caused by the wealthiest. We want the developed country who had already used more than enough fossil fuel to cause the global warming to be accountable for the crops and lands we are losing in our remote villages. We want development justice. Climate change is essentially a social justice issue. It is one symptom of a global system that my community and many similar communities around the world treat as, they treat as nothing. When I came to New York, I was like surprised to see how different the world is. It was a whole different planet than when I worked. We will um, accommodate uh, three questions first, and then let us see uh, how the time runs. Uh, just a reminder to those who will be up, uh, raising their questions to make it very brief and direct to the point. And if you have a particular person uh, from among our speakers to uh, answer, then you can also uh, direct that question to her or to him.
questions, clarification. Okay, I see one hand there, and then I see another hand here. Uh, is there another hand? Otherwise, I will call on, okay, the third one. So, uh, can I have the first one, the brother at the back? Can you come in front and then have the mic so that our speakers will hear you? Hi, I'm Moses. I came from LA for the Climate March, and I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, I'm very interested in the gender analysis this panel is having. Uh, however, I'm a little disappointed because I didn't hear too much of it. I heard a lot of class analysis. Um, development justice is basically an issue of patriarchal development. Uh, we need to talk about patriarchy. We need to talk about how patriarchy devalues women and nature and how that is interrelated with development. So if you can address patriarchy in your local cultures, not just in corporations and capitalist development, because if men decided to no longer uphold the patriarchy, I think capitalism would fall overnight. Thank you. Um. So uh, can we have all the questions first, and then the answers will follow. So uh, the second one who raised his hand, please. Para reconocer en primer lugar la importancia que tiene esta reunión y destacar el concepto importante presentado desde la compañera de Guatemala. Este sistema no funciona. Muy bien, la hermana de Nepal ha comparado lo que pasa en su país con lo que ha encontrado acá. Y cuando vemos esa imagen donde por un lado está el 1% y por el otro lado el 99%, diríamos que esta bonanza es el resultado de que el 1% de la población concentra más del 90% de la riqueza del mundo. Si las cosas van a seguir así, la verdad es que esto no tiene futuro. No tiene futuro para los países del sur, tampoco para los países del norte. Acá se trata de hacer un trabajo conjunto entre los que venimos del sur y los que están en el norte como parte de una responsabilidad conjunta por sacar adelante. Entonces, mi pregunta, ¿qué supone esto de que el sistema no funciona? Si pudieras abundar un poco más, porque creo que esa es la idea central, que debemos interiorizar todos los pueblos del norte y del sur como la alternativa mejor para salvar esto que se llama universo, esto que se llama un, un, humanidad. Manachaya, estamos perdidos. Hayaya. Uh, he said that he agrees with what our colleague from Guatemala said, and he was congratulating the Nepalese intervention by making a comparison between the modes of life of the North and what he has seen here, and in contrast with the reality she, she just have shared, as, as well as the other panelists. And uh, he was saying that he was making a question in regards to that, that image that we have on the 1% of the population is living out of the, with the, in a welfare state because of the exploitation of the other, the re remaining 99%. So he has, he's asking the question to, to Norma in saying in the phrase, we have to change the system. What does that imply? Because he agrees that that is the question, but that will mean different things from people from the north and in the south, but it is clear that we have to make it all together. So as someone who's in local organizing in Fiji, um, I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, one of the things that is frustrating a lot of us is the balance between how you organize outside the UN and how you organize inside, and we've just had some conversations in the women's major group today. There are those who say that we should just 
you know, that, that we have to kind of take di more and more direct action and that that's where the future is from now because of how um, terrible the situation is at 100 to, you know, to 200 species disappearing every day. And then there are others who say we have to work both inside and outside and that it's both the breaking down of certain institutions and the building of others. So I'd love to hear your views on how do we really get to where we need to go um, from now. Thank you. Okay, so we'll bring back the mic to our speakers. So, um, so can anyone from you respond to the first question? And the, uh, the first question is how to address patriarchy in our own cultures. For, for the first question about gender issue, I think he, uh, I'm sorry you got really disappointed, but we didn't really have enough of the, in the panel, we didn't think of, of this as an issue that should be central and planned, but I can tell you from my experience that a lot of the, the, the women that I work with cannot come to the meetings because men still don't let them go to, to get educated, let alone the system, which is not including women for anything. So decision making at the local level is still very difficult because of patriarchal. Uh, so it's not only official, it's it's cultural, and, and yesterday we have Lolita Vasquez from Guatemala who explained really clearly in another panel about the romanticism that we hear sometimes about equality in the Maya cosmovision, but it's not true when it comes down to issues of sexual reproductive rights. So we have a long way to go there and work. Uh, for example, I tell you that sometimes we have capacity building for, uh, and they say, okay, we have uh, one room for one woman and one man. A woman will not go if a man is somebody that they don't know, and sometimes if they don't know them, it could be worse because there's a lot of abuse for that. So there's a lot, a lot that we still need to do in terms of, of that. And sometimes because we don't have resources, we have to have two women at least and one man accompanied because two women will, kind of like protect each other more. So at that level, we still are in many issues. So you can imagine how it is in the, in the other level. So it is just part of the, the question. Talking about migration, the estimates are that from 60 to 80 percent of the women on, on the migrant route get sexually attacked and raped. So, um, Gender issues are extremely important, and I, I have no answers. I, there is a dialectical uh, relationship between the system and, and the gender issues. I don't know which comes first, the egg of the chicken. I don't know whether changing the system will change the gender issues, or changing the gender issues will eventually change the system. It's very difficult, it's very deep, it's very old, it's ancient. And we haven't done a good job in taking care of it. Some of the people that we talk to say, well, you're, your women are responsible. You're the one who educate men. I said, <laughs> you know, it's a very complex and I think it's at the roots of many of the problems that the world is facing. But have no answers, I just have questions. regarding fighting patriarchy in our own community. Patriarchy is so deeply, like deeply, deeply rooted that uh, from the experience of working with the grassroots women in the community, when we organize a program on, okay, women's rights or violence against women, then, then men and husbands are like kind of aggressive and make a sarcastic remark. Oh, why do you need to go there? You people are becoming like more active now. You will not even cook food for us, blah, blah, blah. But then when we, make a program on like things like uh, climate change or education then they are like a bit flexible and open and they let their wife and sisters to attend so i think rather than directly fighting the patriarchy i think we can use this kind of like platform like through climate change education a little bit like more side sightly not directly related issues to fight the deeply rooted patriarchy because this is from my experience by working with them in, in women's rights issue, they really become a bit aggressive. Yeah. Thank you. 
So anyone else from the panel who would like to respond to that? So uh, for the guy who raised the I think that for for me the issue of Patrick is the um, relates to related to cultures uh, because the, um, in my culture I know that that is also breaking down because um, it also was also a misinterpretation of of, of rule and what that is all about but we have inherited in the good culture the fact that the the goddess that we all worship is the woman goddess and. If the goddess that we all honor to be our overall goddess is a woman, then we need to give prominence to the women. And that is why for the good struggle, the success we recorded was because of that realization that women play the key role as the goddess of the land, and we have to give them that prominence. And that is why in everything that we do in the, as far as the good struggle is concerned, was to allow them to drive most of the processes. But the, the area that we think that is an issue is in terms of uh, gender distribution of labor, uh, because we have a situation where, because of the role, the women were far more in the agricultural sector, but you have other sectors like the palm wine, the palm tapping and all that, that were more the main uh, sector uh, driven. And what oil exploitation did was that it destroyed the agricultural base uh, uh, labor, division of labor that was there. And that, for women, there was no alternative because most of them, from their bed and everything, were always uh, doing the agriculture. And that is where we saw the greatest impact because moving out of that agri-based economy where they had no alternatives, we now saw where they were moving out of the communities into the, the cities. And for us, that is what we needed to now tackle from that uh, uh, perspective. But in terms of um, um, looking at the patriarchism, for us, it's not uh, something that manifests in all sectors, even when we still have to contend with that uh, discrimination. The only place we saw that strong is in the main child preference syndrome, which is still something that is strong in our country. But in terms of labor, in terms of uh, uh, their role in the struggle, I think the fact that we tie it to the fact that the women provide a goddess, which is the number one god that we have, then they have a greater role to play in the struggle. Um, thank you very much. We can go on and on with the, the discussion, uh, but uh, give it again the time limit, uh, we have to uh, proceed to the next, but yeah. In terms of uh, like, uh, 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 yeah, when we talk, when we speak about development justice, this is also a part of it. Uh, and so uh, in the, uh, it's part of it, so we have uh, gender uh, justice that's also integrated into the into the framework. So I shall move to the second question, and this is uh, uh, particularly directed to Norma. Uh, like, if we say system change, what do uh, what does this actually uh, what does this actually mean, and uh, how does uh, this imply to? Uh, the people in the north and the people in the south. Yeah, thank you, Jorge. I think it it has to do a lot with uh, what we think development is, and we hear over and over the issue of sustainable development, but uh, we should ask development for who, and also the meaning of what happiness is. What makes people happy? And maybe what the the development means destroying earth for the for the uh, for the uh, enriched countries. Should we model that for us? And that's the 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 ideal of what capitalism is: consume and destroy earth. Is that uh, what we hear in course? And and so we need to re re. Re, re think about this. 
And I think other countries are doing it. Many other countries, uh, in like uh, in Latin America and South America, there is when we build the other concepts of what development is or what whatever uh, living well means. So those 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 uh, uh, concepts of development are there. It's not that the the system has not pay attention to that because it's not money making because it's not a uh, merchandise but the systems are there people have have different ways of, of of life but the system that is overriding everything and cultures and and, and, and nature and resources is the capitalist system and so we think this is the end of it this is the era of capitalism and then that's it and there's nobody to to confront that anymore. We don't have the other side that used to be like the socialist uh, block. So we think this is the paradigm of, of, of what life in this earth means. Other groups, indigenous groups, had had this differently. But of course we're being repressed. People are being uh, taking over the land. Uh, people have migrated and coming to other cultures and, and be kind of like uh, dysfunctional within this system because we can we can reach this sueño americano, the American dream world. So go back to our countries, deported usually, and, and we're less and less adapted to that because no land, no soil. So it's more and more difficult because we have become as human, <coughs> As humankind, we have like become disposable to a system. So, and we are disposable people now that are like recycling. You know, the new generations are going to be born and use up and then destroy uh, spiritually and become trash. And then there's the next generation. That's how I see the system. So we need, we have we, in the virgin need to change this. We need to have a different value system. I don't have the answer. How are we going to do it? I, I know we don't want solidarity, because I don't like that word. We want core responsibility. Not solidarity, because it's not about you being in the, in the North solidarious with the people in the South, because you see the destruction that's going on. I think it is a matter of core responsibility and question that ourselves. I'm, I don't. I can't tell you that the people in the South is going to change this. I think he has, he has a total re responsibility as a humankind. And I don't think it's a magic, something to transform this. It, it, it requires our whole participation. And that's what I think it, it was over exciting about 400,000 people yesterday or the day before. But I think we require 400,000 people every day until we change this and don't become so overexcited about this, although it was very replenishing. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, is there anyone from the, from the speakers who would like to add to that? If not, I think for, for me, the whole thing about system change, we still um, have to find ways to deal with our mad obsession for money, which is all capitalism is all about, and then see how we can show greater compassion for Mother Nature, because as said, we show compassion for Mother Nature and for humanity, I don't see us being able to change the system. Uh, and that is where, for some of us, the whole idea of faith, compassion, and the values now come into to play. Because where we lost a sense of value of our common humanity, where we lost the the, the fact that we 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 owe Mother Nature the the all that we needed to do to protect her, then I don't think we can change the system. But if we reverse that and have a new thinking about 
How do you, I, I was speaking to that day, I said, where are you, the whole balance of even the climate change adaptation that is going on? If you look at what has been going on so far, the entire climate adaptation fund is just about 200 million US dollars. Now, when the damage fund was established in Germany, the government spent 10 billion US dollars. So if you look at the gap between 10 billion US dollars and 200 million US, uh, million US dollars, you see that, that is the, the, the world leaders are still deceiving us in a way that doesn't show that people are showing compassion for humanity. Maybe I'll just share as, as an educator, a teacher, uh, maybe changing the system is, is, is really going to be a long way. But uh, I, I think it is more on the appreciation of the people, like example, the Filipino people, of their own, uh, their own culture. You know, and me as a part of the education system, as a teacher, I think uh, the changing a system would also mean the changing of consciousness of, uh, of people, especially the children, you know. In our country, uh, there had been a study which tried to survey ch children and tried to find out if you, were, if you had a choice, what, what uh, nationality will you choose? You know, and it's sad to think that the results showed only 10% wanted to be Filipinos. 10% of the children. So it's for me as a teacher a challenge, no? To make these children appreciate and love the Filipinos, the Philippines. First of all, I'm not saying we should be separated from the rest of the world, but each of, one should, each, each of us in our own country should love our country. Be, before we can love others, I think we should appreciate ourselves. Only then can we maybe uh, work together to help our country, you know? And so uh, that's it. It's more really the change of consciousness of people, which is a responsibility, not only of the educators, but everybody, especially those who are working with, with communities. Can I just add up the, the uh, people who are doing excellent efforts? Like I have to ponder on the Filipinos in these cases. Uh, they are reaching out and doing more and more the international people's movement on self-determination and liberation. That's something that they have, like, reach out and see, you know, we have the same problem, so let's work <coughs> together with the same problem. So I, you have to really acknowledge this effort and, and these Filipino young people who are, don't sleep like the people in New York, they work, work, work. So I want to ponder on them and thank them for also bringing us here. Uh, they brought people from Peru, from Guatemala, and they are from very far away, the Filipino Islands. So I want to thank them for doing this effort too. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. I'm being warned already that we are, <laughs> time is running very fast. So, uh, can we uh, uh, get a response uh, on the third question, which is like the balance of organizing inside and outside the UN, and yeah, the need for more direct actions. So, okay, Ch uh, Chiten and then Sarah, who else from the panel who would like to respond, and then uh, Marta. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's very important to uh, guess both, uh, because like if we want to make change at the community level or the, at the local level, I think that both of them is very much important. Because like if you don't lead, engage at a larger level, we cannot just let the devil let loose, do anything that they want, you know. So like it's important for us to keep a check and balance on what's happening, uh, to keep a check especially. And also, again, it's again a matter of strategy, you know. It's again a matter of strategy. If you really wanted to make change again, it's a matter of strategy like what happened because, it's, for example, it's important to know what what's happening in the larger process, you know, then so that we can better prepare in our own context. I know that there is a lot of frustration, like especially, in, I was referring to the case of dam, you know, because we are a couple of, like Bapitel Dam, Tipaimo, I was referring to Lokak, you know, we were able to engage the UN human rights system, and some of the special rapport here on indigenous people's rights, for example, it comes from very strong recommendation, but those recommendations are not implemented, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, lot of fr fr frustration, we got the UN search committee, 
uh, you know, Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination coming up with a strong recommendation saying that no to big dams without the free plan from consent of the community. But then those are not implemented. But then we use it, it helps because it helps in generating awareness within our community, you know. Comes up with a very strong political position and the more that refuse to take steps, it helps the community to take a more stronger position and to assert the rights better and stronger and stronger. So ultimately, uh, I, I, I think that's that, and to carry forward that same message again to the larger process, you know, to take more action, I think. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's more important. Thanks. Okay. I, 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 I think based um, from my own experience, I think that what we may need to do is uh, we need more of horizontal grassroots mobilization uh, of our communities and also a very serious graduate education. What I've seen in our own, uh, based on our own experience, if the, those at the grassroots are well educated and mobilized about certain issues or the issues you are pursuing, I mean, mobilizing them for a greater action is easy. Um, and for me, I think it would be a combination of direct action on the ground against the entity because the forces we are contending with are very serious, brutal, dangerous forces that we know that it's going to be a lot of sacrifice. Uh, but people must be prepared to come out, to engage, to do the protests, to do the marches, and then combine that with whatever thing you are doing within the UN system. For those of us who have engaged with the UN system, we know that it's one of the, the slowest institutions to engage with. But it's good in some respect because if you get something good from that area combined with your local mobilization, it will turn the page for you. Because that was what we did in the case of Shell and Ogoni, and we were able to push her out of our land without being thrown a tone. But the massive protests that took place in Ogoni forced them to leave the area. I think one of the, uh, the most important things that we can do as a strategist would be to have the ability to know what the people are doing, what they want. Like Mexico that is um, being governed by organized crime on, on the ground, people are forming community police all over and they're calling themselves, we're self-defense. We're autodefensas, somos autodefensas. And they're doing their own policing and they're getting criminals out of their towns. I think no, uh, even, we should keep on organizing, of course, but we should have a new ready for what, what the people are ready and what the people want to do and be able to really make it strong and support it. And that, that would be my biggest, organizing in, uh, or working with the authorities. Or I, I've been at it 50 years. I'm, frankly, I, I'm fed up with it. I have no hope that change is going to come from anywhere except from the people. Solo el pueblo salva al pueblo. Solo el pueblo salva al pueblo. Salva al pueblo. Solo el pueblo salva al pueblo. Only the people saves the people. Uh, regarding what needs to be done, to speak very frankly with my yesterday's from the experience of the yesterday from the front lines, voices from the front lines of climate change. I was there myself uh, from Nepal and Uganda and from Solomon Island. And when we were telling stories of our community, there were lots of surprising and, and oh wow, that's, 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 that could happen in a community. There were lots of amazement and surprising. I think that surprising and amazement should end because that is the reality what people live in the community. And I think and that is the other reason. And the other thing is like, there are small women's group who cannot even run their own group, who don't even don't know how to have a bank account, to run a bank account. Those are the ones in the need. And there are the other big funders with billions of dollars. They, are, they want to eradicate proper, poverty and uh, education and health care like that. But then those funds does not go to them because they don't, they don't even have education to write a small proposal uh, to, write, to meet their criteria. So how to put that fund to them? So I think there is a huge gap and something has to be done to bridge this gap. Then only there will be like things will change, I think. Thank you. 
So, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry that we will not be able to uh, get the two more, uh, the, the two others who are raising their hands, but uh, probably you can always like get in touch with the, peop uh, the Campaign for People's Goals, the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, Ibon International, International Indigenous People's Movement for Self-Determination, and the other organizations who are in the same, uh, who are into uh, de uh, development justice. So we also have like materials on the, on the, on that, uh, on this corner, and there's like, uh, yeah, a video document, yeah, a, a documentary on this is our land. So uh, there's limited copies, but uh, it's for free. So you can also get your copy. Now, the next part of the program is going to be outdoors. So I will request everyone to go outdoors. So we will just uh, take the, the way that uh, we, en we, we enter the Huelago in coming here. And I will uh, also request uh, uh, the allies who will be giving their statements to uh, also uh, prepare. Because while we will be lighting the, the candles for development justice, we will also be asking the allies to be giving their three-minute uh, statement of uh, solid solidarity. Uh, okay, so while we are lighting the candles, uh, uh, let us uh, listen to the messages of solidarity from uh, friends of the Campaign for People's Goals uh, for Development Justice. So, uh, I'll first call on uh, Widow. <laughs> Widow is the Women's Environmental, Environment and Development Organization that's based here in New York. So, can we have the the representative? Okay, there she is. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much. My name is Linda Burns from the Women's Environment and Development Organization. I'm really honored to be here for this People's General Assembly as I was honored to march in the streets with so many of you on Sunday. So many of those people who spoke today have been our teachers and our educators. Oh, my candle went out. In the, in the last years, months, weeks of advocacy, both inside and outside the halls of the UN, and importantly on the streets. I think that last question of where do we do the most change, how do we affect change, can we be inside the process and outside the process at the same time? And as I look around in this space and see people who I have met making art for the People's Climate March, who I have listened to in this People's General Assembly, and who I've slept in the halls of the UN with, I think that we can be responsible enough to take on the importance of people's stories, of the real challenges that people are facing to work with inside these processes because we know that we need formal seats at the table in order to not be left out, in order to make sure that we don't have horrible or, if, or bad legislation going forward, but we also need to have informal spaces like this to take those tables, to turn them upside down, and to reject them if we have to. So we stand in solidarity with all those who spoke, and as Norma said, in responsibility, as myself as a young woman from the North, to continue bringing people into the streets as, was, as what happened on Sunday. So thank you very much. I am here to represent um, hundreds of organizations and citizens who have decided to come together um, because next year is such an important year. We have two uh, very big summits that will take place here in New York on the development side and in Paris on the climate side. And 2015 is going to represent such a big year because of what we can achieve, but, but also because of the risks uh, uh, if we don't get the objectives uh, 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 we want to obtain. So many organizations have come together to um, try to build up citizens' movement because we are, have been creating and, and working through advocacy for many years and, and this may not be sufficient to get the uh, uh, ambitious outcomes we want to obtain. So we are going to be building a citizens' movement to ensure that action does not only take place here in New York or, or, or with key governments, but also takes place in the streets with people and the citizens, like all of us, um, 
bringing their voices to the debate to make sure that next year is a big year for all of us. So thank you for all of you to be here tonight and I'm very humbled to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michi from Engagement Strategies. Are you here? Michi? Okay. I'm Michi. I'm from Oxfam. And I really want to speak, I'm supposed to speak about climate change, but I really want to speak about gender. And I think it's about time now, uh, possibly we go back to the drawing board and stop gender and run with the patriarchy as a word. To me, personally, as a woman, as an African woman, a very young woman, uh, born and raised in a patriarchal society, patriarchy is not culture. And I think we really have to move away of looking at patriarch and gender dimension as culture, we really have to look at it as an economical concept, as a political concept, as a social concept. We cannot separate these things. As a woman, you are determined, you sort of like predetermine your level of ambition. The gesture that we get in the boardroom, the expectation from the society, the expectation from our male colleagues, all of that tells what, what we can and what we cannot do as a woman. Development justice cannot be separated from gender justice. This is one and the same thing. And we really have to fight, the, I mean, we really have to end development justice from the angle and the glass of gender justice. Looking at that, we have seen the statistics on the poverty, the most affected by climate change, the illiterate, all of them speak about women. So if we really have to develop, who are we developing? So women, so there is no, there is no way we can separate these two concepts and we really now have to put our gender glass on, have to be proud as a woman, has to be proud as a woman of color, which you sort of have been in a simultaneous disadvantage. First you are women and second you are women of color, like where is your place? You know, so we really have to take this discussion back. We really have to engage and showcase and be proud of what we can and we cannot do. Our movement, we sort of, we have sort of like unwritten um, constitution for the women's group. Yes, you can be a, a chairman, but for the men group, be content to be a secretary. That has been the culture, and until we position women to be powerful, to know that I don't deserve to ask you for permission, I can do what I think is right because I have a life of dignity and I have a right to choose the life that I deserve. They say there's a proverb which is saying, teach uh, them to fish, not give them, yeah? Don't give them fish, teach them how to fish. But did we ever ask, what if they don't eat fish, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what if they don't eat fish? So why are you saying let's give all women a life of choice and dignity that they can choose for themselves? Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm from Bangladesh and we know that the world population today is 7 billion people and half are women. That's three point, over 3.5 billion women, but we still don't have any gender justice. Coming from Bangladesh, we know that we are one of the lowest contributors to climate change. But who's the worst affected? It's Bangladesh. We are here in New York today, um, and the US is one of the countries that still haven't signed the Kyoto Protocol. They're organizing the climate um, the climate justice, the People's March, and we've been talking about it for 20 years, but still there is no environmental justice. And I think these two are really uh, related because when we look at Bangladesh, the work that we've been doing, we find that um, a lot of times in the flood and cyclone prone areas, the women are the ones who are the most vulnerable. They don't have access to many of the services they need. And this also relates to their sexual and reproductive health rights. Um, we, we saw that the 13th um, session, the outcome document of SDGs were passed, but no mention of sexual and reproductive health rights and no mention of comprehensive sexual education. If men are able to take decisions about their um, sexual partners and their sexual pleasures, why can't we as women take these decisions? So I think it's time to end the silence. We need to talk about the importance of gender in climate issues. And therefore, I think we need to um, move forward and bring this movement 
both at the local level and at the international level. Thank you. So they got from CLADEM. CLADEM is a Latin American Caribbean Co Committee for the Defense of Women's Rights. Hi everyone, I'm not, I represent CLADEM. I'm not a victim myself of the climate change. But uh, CLADEM works in 15 countries of the Latin American region. Uh, our representative or our women from different um, colors of their skin, from heterosexual or, um, or white women who fights in their own countries against this political and social um, uh, system that victimize our um, commit violence against women and deny their reproductive lives. We as CLADEN are committed to uh, to defense of women as it was presented on this night by the question of how, what can we do. I think that one of the um, uh, main issues that CLADEN could give is that the use of the international agencies for protection for human rights as we have been um, using it to um, um, push countries to uh, for the appliance and commitment that have been made by the international treaty bodies. Thank you. Can we have uh, Urna from Mongolia? Yes, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm, I'm uh, very glad that I had a chance to be in this event and listen to all of your stories. And it was more encouraging in, in enriching me a lot even more than the UN General Assembly uh, special session on, on uh, population and development. It was really boring to listen to our Minister <laughs> of Social Welfare who is lying about comprehensive sexuality education and, and reproductive health rights, which are, as if he is saying, implemented in Mongolia. But I can say that uh, from our socialist past, and after the transition to market economy, after the almost 20 years, uh, the situation of women's and girls' uh, sexual rights and reproductive health rights worsened. I can say that it's just worsened. And in relation to patriarchy, I just want to say that when women and girls will genuinely enjoy their sexual rights, reproductive health rights, only this time the real development justice will come because these rights will be enjoyed by women and girls only when they have power in politics, power in economics, and power in culture. Thank you. We will call on uh, Paul Kintos from Ibon International. Uh, first of all, thank you. In behalf of the co-organizers of this event, uh, Asia Pacific Women for Law and Development, uh, WIDO, uh, the Indigenous Peoples Movement for uh, Self-Determination and Liberation, did I forget? Uh, um, the and, campaign. Oh, and of course the, the, campaign. the campaign for People's Goals, of uh, which I'm part. Thank you to everyone who came here. Uh, and of course, most of all, to our participants from uh, from Guatemala, from Nepal, from Nigeria, from the Philippines, from Mexico, yes, from Mexico, from Peru, and everyone. No, I think uh, what we have seen here, the fact that we were able to gather all these people from different parts of the world with their different struggles and advocacies, goes to show that uh, the development justice as a framework, as an aspiration for an alternative. Uh, mode of development is a, a powerful theme. It's a powerful uh, framework for bringing groups together from different countries, whether they're fighting primarily about for gender justice, for ecological justice, for economic justice, for social justice or redistribution, uh, and of course accountability to the peoples. I think uh, the, the five transformative shifts that, the, that this framework is uh, articulating uh, is able to unite uh, a good spectrum of, of uh, people who are fighting for, for uh, a new form of development. So 
uh, again, thank you. And uh, I guess what I would like to also emphasize is that the, this doesn't end here, obviously. Uh, we have a website, uh, peoplesghost.org backslash devjustice, wherein we will be uh, compiling information on the struggles and the campaigns that we talked about here and others so that we can see what uh, grassroots communities are from, from different countries, how they are fighting for development justice. Because this fight for development justice is not uh, primarily or mainly about going to the UN, coming to New York, attending the UN General Assembly and so on. It, it's really primarily fought on the ground through the daily struggles of communities who are exploited and oppressed in different parts of the world. And so we, we hope that you will visit that site, get more information, and find out how you can uh, further support concretely these struggles on the ground and how we can unite in solidarity for development justice. Thank you. Unlike governments who always twist the truth, we have heard the real stories of injustices. <laughs> I'm sure that there are a hundred more stories that can be shared here. Think about incidents of hung other incidents of hunger, displacement, discrimination, inequality, and injustice happening around the world because of a social system that's already moribund, the advanced state of capitalism then hampered growth and globalization of capitalist production and consumption has produced a world that is deeply unequal and dangerously unsustainable. The call for us is to advance development justice, a transformative development framework that aims to reduce inequalities of wealth, power and resources between countries, between rich and poor, and between men and women. It is a development framework that places people that is the majority poor and the marginalized at the front and center of development. It is a paradigm for development that upholds people are the primary agents and subjects of change. Development justice upholds that development will and should be designed and adapted in response to the aspirations of the people and their available resources. For indigenous peoples, we call this self-determined sustainable development and not imposed by technocrats and so-called high-level experts for all time and for all. Development justice is grounded in five foundational shifts, which Paul already mentioned. One, redistributive justice. Second, economic justice. Third, gender and social justice. Fourth, environmental justice, and fifth, accountability to the people that empower all, but especially the most marginalized, to exercise free, prior, and informed decision-making in all stages of development uh, processes. Clearly, we have an alternative framework for development, that is development justice. From the Philippines to Nepal, India to Papua New Guinea, from Nigeria to Latin America, from indigenous peoples, women, migrants, peasants and food producers, workers and many other marginalized sectors including people with disability and other identities, we all need to struggle. And we do, and we do not struggle as individuals, but we struggle as movements. We struggle not in isolation with each other, but we struggle in solidarity as one broad but solid movement to realize development justice. We ground our struggles in communities and in workplaces. It is important that we raise our local and national struggles to international level, which is why the Campaign for People's Goals for Development Justice was created by no other than organizations or movements. We see the setting up of other platforms that we can all be part of in fostering and advancing global solidarity of peoples to resist neoliberal globalization, 
militarization, and fundamentalism. Let us bring back the vibrance that we created in this Second People's General Assembly for Development Justice to our own organizations and movements. Let us share and coordinate our actions through the Campaign for People's Goals. Let us create more spaces in amplifying our voices, especially the grassroots for development justice. To the organizers, Campaign for People's Goals, Ibon International, Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, you have done an impressive work to make this People's General Assembly happen. Oh, I forgot to mention the Indigenous People's Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. To the speakers, you have made the development in justice real and your stories urge us to push for development justice. To all of you, your presence give hope to this planet. Long live international solidarity. The women united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. The people united will never be defeated. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. In closing, we will uh, request uh, the gong players from the Cordillera Philippines but who are residing in New York and New Jersey to please come and lead the dance and we invite everybody to join the solidarity dance in celebration of what we achieved in today's second People's General Assembly and of course in celebration also for the other successes and victories that we have achieved as we advance development justice. Bev, Bev, come for the detail. Oh, detail.